So you want a snake that's small, cute, burrows underground a lot, easy to take care of. Well, there's the Kenyan sand boa, or if you want all of that stuff, but it also being venomous, there's the Western hognose snake. So yes, technically the Western hognose snake is a venomous snake, but we'll talk about that more in depth in a minute. But for now, you can rest assured knowing that it is clearly not a dangerous lethal snake. Otherwise, I would not be holding it like this. I would not be letting kids hold it a program. So just trust me, I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional. Where to go? Before we get into the actual care, my usual two warnings when it comes to my care guides. First off, don't let this be the only research that you do. Read other care sheets, watch other care videos, try and learn as much as you can about a hognose snake before you bring it home. I'm flattered you think that I'm going to be able to be your sole source of knowledge for animals, but that's just not realistic. And number two, we are not going to be talking about breeding in this care guide because I'm an educator, I'm not a breeder. I only have one hognose snake. I've never tried breeding them. I actually know very little about breeding reptiles in general. So yeah, breeding, we're just, we're not gonna talk about it. There's other people that can teach you much, much more than I ever could because hognose apparently are pretty easy for new breeders to get into, but I'm not one of them. Hognose snakes are small, really. They're a fairly small snake. The males usually max out at about a foot long. Females can hit up to three feet and they usually get adult weight, probably a max of a pound for a big female, a little over that. Obviously Bernie here is nowhere near that. Bernie here is my education hognose snake. I got him a few years ago from a breeder that was going to try and breed him with a female, but it looked like she might eat him instead of actually making babies. So they decided to look for a bigger male and uh, he came to live with me. And he's as big as he's going to get. He's almost six years old now. And you can see he's not a, he's not a very big snake. As I said, males usually aren't. And he is what we call kind of like a wild type coloration. This is what you're going to see for hognose snakes in their native range in like Midwest, North America. This is what they look like. Now in captivity, there's a whole bunch of different morphs you can get. There's anaconda, superconda. I'm not really a morph guy, so I'm not gonna be able to name all of them or really even identify most of them. But there are some really cool looking hognose snake morphs out there for sale. But I'm kind of a sucker just for how animals look in the wild. So just about any animal I get if I can I try and get what their like wild coloration is so yes hognose snakes are a venomous snake but they're not like most of your other venomous snakes like your lapids or your vipers like cobras rattlesnakes things like that these guys their teeth are different so with your normal venomous snakes they have two fangs at the front of their mouth and those fangs are hollow and whenever they bite the prey that's the first thing that goes in the prey are those two big fangs at the front and those fangs the venom comes right through those hollow fangs and it's going to usually envenomate really really quickly these guys are what we call a rear fang venomous snake and what i mean by that is they are not so much fangs at the front and hollow, they basically have an enlarged tooth at the back of their mouth. And there's a lot of rear fang venomous snake species. You've got hognose snakes, mangrove snakes, even garter snakes. For you Americans, garter snakes are technically rear fang venomous. But the reason why we're not super, super scared of them like we are rattlesnakes here in the US is because their venom is super mild. And because that fang, that enlarged tooth at the back of the mouth is all the way back there, it's not like a cobra where when it bites, that's the first thing that goes in. This, it's at the back. So they really have to bite and work their mouth onto whatever they're eating in order to envenomate it. And the venom is super, super mild. Not only that, but remember fangs are hollow. These guys, the tooth, it basically has a groove in it. It works kind of like how we think monitor lizard ven envenomation works, where when they bite in, they're going to slowly drip the venom down that groove. And this venom, they are primarily amphibian eaters in the wild. So this venom is designed to go after frogs and toads, things like that. It's not designed to work on a giant mammal, even a kid or anything like that. So their venom is very, very mild. And the, the reactions for anyone that does end up getting envenomated, and again, it takes a bit, but for anyone that does, the reactions vary anywhere from about as bad as a bee sting to maybe some of the more severe reactions are your arm kind of gets hurt or swollen or things like that. It's still, it's nothing like getting bit by a rattlesnake. And if it makes you feel any better, New York State, where I live, all venomous snakes are illegal to own, all of them. Even a lot of your large rear fang snakes, like mangrove snakes and stuff, where the venom is still not really dangerous to an adult human, these guys are legal though. You can buy hognose snakes across New York State, no problem, because the venom is so mild and they are so small and the envenomation method is so 
slow and non-dangerous that New York State's like, yeah, it's fine. Saying that though, I would still check with your local laws to make sure that they are legal to be had as a pet because even though New York is pretty lax about this particular species, there are some cities or even states or countries where these guys might be prohibited just because government's like, ah, they're venomous, whatever, ban them. Just make sure you check kind of with your local legislation to make sure that they are okay to be owned as pets before you get one. Captive bred ones are very easy to find because they're very easy to breed in captivity. Now, depending on where you live, especially if you live in like the Midwest of North America, like United States and Canada, just verify and double check that the hognose snake you're getting from a breeder or anyone online or anything like that is in fact a captive bred one because out there someone might just be going out into the wild and field collecting some and trying to sell them for cheap. So just 100% confirm that you are getting a captive bred hognose snake. The biggest thing is because, well, I mean, in general, captive bred ones usually are much easier to work with and handle, but since these guys are amphibian eaters, if you're taking one out of the wild, they can be a lot harder to get started on frozen thawed or even live rodent prey. You can get a normal one like this for anywhere from 50, 100, maybe $150, depending on the sex and the size. Obviously a really big female is gonna go for more than Bernie here would. And you can get a lot, again, not really a morph guy, but you can get a lot of really cool looking hognose snake morphs for a couple hundred dollars. So you get a lot of variety for not a whole lot of money. Just as with all reptiles, there's a bunch of different things you can house them in and all come with their own pros and cons. Some of them are going to be much better suited for a species of this size. Some of them will be better suited for large snakes. So we're going to go over each of them and what I think kind of works best. First up is the one I recommend most for new hognose snake owners and really most new kind of small snake owners in general. It's just a glass tank, a glass aquarium. You go to just about any pet store and you'll find them. They're really easy to sanitize. They're really easy to kind of move because at this size, you're not going to need like a hundred gallon tank, which will be really heavy. These size tanks much more manageable. They're also very good at keeping humidity low because this does not need a high humidity. You want something that is going to have a lot of airflow in it and this with a mesh lid on it is perfect for that. And now with this mesh lid, you're gonna to wanna to put clamps on it because these guys are pretty good escape artists, really all snakes are, but they're very good at kind of worming their way up the corners of those tanks along the silicone, pushing their nose and then getting out. So just make sure if you have a glass tank with the mesh lid, get something to weigh it down with because if this snake can get out, it's going to. And a snake this size is pretty hard to find in your house. For an adult male hog nose, you're probably gonna want something like 15 gallon to 20 gallon long tank. They are a terrestrial species, so they need ground space more than they need vertical space. So you're never going to want to get like a 55 gallon tank really because all that airspace is just going to kind of be unused. But if you have a big female, two to three feet, your best bet is probably a 30 to 40 gallon breeder size with the 40 gallon obviously being much more ideal because it gives you a whole bunch of ground space, gives you a lot of nice area for substrate depth, which this species really needs. So it's just all around 20 gallon long, I would say for an adult male, an adult female, probably 40 gallon breeder. Then you've got PVC enclosures, which honestly are what I keep just about all my snakes in. They are super lightweight, very easy to move. They're also very easy to sanitize because it's basically just a box. Now saying that with this closed in box, you have to make sure that the humidity doesn't build up too much because that's one thing PVC enclosures are very good at and hognose snakes do not like. So you might have to either do what I did and drill a couple additional holes in it to allow that airflow or when you order it, custom order it with some screen on it attached to it. And that's another kind of caveat with PVC is you most likely will need to buy it because a lot of you probably don't have the know-how to work it yourself. If you do know how to build it yourself, great, you'll save some money. But I mean, for the grand majority of us, we don't really work with PVC very often. It's not the same as cutting wood. So you'll probably have to buy it either at a reptile expo or online because they don't sell it at pet stores. And it can be really pricey. Now, luckily it's not like getting a four by eight by four like I got for my Tegu. It's not gonna be over a thousand dollars. What right now, what I have Bernie in is a two by two by one foot enclosure. And that cost, I think like $160 from who I got it from. So the price is gonna range a little bit depending on who you get your PVC enclosure from, but they are a great enclosure. They are super long lasting. You don't have to worry about dropping and breaking it like you would a glass tank. And with a female, you'll probably wanna do more like a three by two by one instead of a two by two by one like him. So you will need a little additional extra space, but it's still not super huge. Then you've got wood enclosures. Now wood is basically like a kind of heavier version of PVC in a way, because again, you're gonna either have to build it yourself or find someone to build it for you. Now with wood enclosures, they are much heavier because you're dealing with wood, not lightweight plastic. And you do have to worry about sealing the inside of the enclosure because humidity 
and moisture are obviously going to kind of degrade the wood. So you will need to seal the inside of it. I don't really recommend it for hognose snakes because with the weight and all that stuff, it's just really not worth it for the size of the enclosure. You're much better off just going with one of the other options. But if you want to do it, you can. Last up is probably the one I recommend most after glass. It's just a plastic tub. You just go to really any store, Walmart, Target, you can go on Amazon, whatever, and get a decent sized plastic bin with a lid. This is really nice because you can customize it pretty well. You can either cut a hole in the top and put mesh over and super glue it down. You can drill holes in the side for airflow. It really kind of lets you do whatever you want with it. Now, with a snake this size, you don't need a super huge plastic tote. I would say a 28 quart would be good for really a male or a smaller female. You might want to upgrade to a little bit bigger one if you have a really big female. And you can either use a standalone tub or you can put it in a rack system. I know a lot of breeders and a lot of reptile YouTubers too that'll keep their hognose snakes in rack systems. They work very, very well for them. Hognose snakes are kind of secretive. If you, uh, We'll talk about it in a little bit, but they spend a lot of time in their substrate too. So they don't really like being out and exposed. So a rack system is really perfect for this. Now, if you're gonna keep it in a standalone plastic bin, get clamps or something to keep the lid down because remember they are escape artists and usually the two kind of like pop on claps that you get on like a 28 quart tub aren't going to be enough to keep the hognose snake from getting out in the middle so that's just another thing you want to be careful of when you are getting a plastic tub for your snake for bedding there are both good and bad options but there are a lot of good options for a hognose snake that work very very well first we're going to go over the bad ones though the first bad option is just straight sand whether that's play sand or calcium sand calcium sand if you have a reptile of any type and you're watching this and you keep your reptile on calcium sand please throw it out. Please burn the calcium sand. Please throw it into the moon. Whatever. Get rid of it because calcium sand is an absolute garbage substrate. It kills way more animals than it helps. So please just don't do it. Now as far as straight play sand or anything like that goes is these guys they're not an arid snake. They're not like a sidewinder or something you'd find in the desert. These guys where they're from the wild there's a lot of dry loose sandy soil but that's just it. It's soil mix. It's not straight sand so they don't want it. The second option I would say completely avoid would be pine and cedar wood shaving wood chip bedding that you'll see a lot for hamsters and guinea pigs and things like that they're actually finding it's not even good for those animals to be on this so it's not good to be on it's not good to be in it's not good to breathe in so please do not get this particular wood shaving bedding for your snake now for decent to good beddings your first option is going to be the super easy and affordable either newspaper or paper towel and this is great for when you first bring a new snake home and this is what I recommend anyone do that you're bringing a new reptile home is keep it on newspaper keep it in a quarantine setup so you can monitor it make sure it's eating make sure it's pooping make sure it's poops look healthy things like that but long term I really wouldn't keep a hognose snake on newspaper or paper towel for super long because they like to burrow they like deep substrate so you do not want to keep them on just normal paper where they won't be able to do that so we talked about the bad wood shaving beddings but the great bedding that's wood shaving that I use for Bernie and a lot of my colubrid snakes is aspen bedding. Aspen bedding is a tremendous substrate. It holds burrows super, super well. You can get a lot of depth out of it. It's very easy to spot clean. It's very easy to completely change out, dump out and put new ones in. There's also other loose substrate options like dry eco earth or cypress mulch. This stuff will work just fine for you, but when it's dry, especially the eco earth can get a bit dusty, so look out for that. And these substrates are designed to hold in humidity. So if you're keeping the hog nose with this in PVC enclosure or something like that, just make sure the humidity does it get too too high and the last option is probably the most realistic for what this snake has in the wild it's going to be a mix of things take some dry eco earth get some washed play sand from the hardware store and make sure it's the play sand and not like the industrial or paver sand make sure it's actual pay, uh, play sand and then you mix that in with just some plain old organic topsoil mix that all together it holds burrows really really well it can usually if you put a lot of depth to it you can use for a bioactive substrate put some live plants and stuff in there go nuts so that can work very very well like like I said, right now, Bernie here, who's sitting very well behaved. <laughs> Bernie here is on aspen bedding, but in the past I have had hog noses on this sand soil mix and it worked very, very well. One thing I will say though, is when you get the topsoil, make sure you kind of go through it and filter through it before you put it in with the snake. Cause sometimes you'll get like little pieces of plastic and things like that in it just cause they bag it up and send it out. Cause normally people are using it for their yard. So just do that before you put it in. But other than that, it works very, very well. Whichever bedding you choose, whether it's the aspen, the eco earth, the soil, whatever, Give them a bunch of substrate depth. I would say an inch and a half, two inches minimum. If you can give them more than that, that'll be great because they like to burrow a lot. That's what that nose is designed for is to dig into the ground. So you give them a lot of substrate, they're going to be very happy. And obviously, if you get one of the substrates that holds burrows a bit better like the aspen, they'll probably be more happier with that. But just make sure you give them a good substrate depth.
with hog noses being found just about in all of smack dab in the middle of North America. They are obviously not a tropical snake, and they're not really an arid snake either. For the warm side, you want it somewhere in the high 80s, like 86 to 89, 90 degrees, something like that. And they do bask sometimes, so for a basking spot that's either directly above or below your heat source, you're gonna want it a few degrees higher than that, so probably low 90s. And for the cool side, you want it somewhere in like low 80s to high 70s, like in the 77 to 82 degree range. For nighttime, it's fine if it cools off a bit. This is a North American snake, so I would say a drop off into the high 60s is completely fine. The biggest thing is just making sure they warm up the next day. So as long as you still have your heat source that's getting them to that 80, 90 degrees every day, they'll be fine if it drops into the high 60s at night. I use a temperature gun to check the temperatures of the surfaces in my enclosures. It's very easy to just take the gun, point it. It's not an actual gun, I should note. It's like a laser gun. You put it at the surface, point it, and it'll tell you the exact temperature of that surface is very handy it tells you what the actual surface that your animal is on you can move the bedding and see what it's like underneath if you have like an under tank heater it's much much more accurate than those little like crappy stick on thermometers that they put on like glass aquariums and stuff that they sell at pet stores please don't get those it's a waste of four dollars they are very inaccurate and a lot of them break pretty quick so just don't use that go to a hardware store or something get a temperature gun for 20 25 dollars and boom you're set remember these do not like high humidity you want it under 50 percent probably closer to 30 percent is better if you can a water bowl in the enclosure will be enough you don't need to mist the whole enclosure down too high of a humidity can lead to either scale rot if the bedding gets too damp or it can lead to respiratory infections with them breathing in that humid air all the time when they're not designed to. You can provide them with what's called a humid hide, which is essentially just a special either plastic or ceramic kind of hide box for them to go into. And you're going to put something in there like paper towel or sphagnum moss that you can mist down and it'll help hold humidity. Now, I would not put this in there all the time. I would only put it in when you notice your hognose snake is in shed. And you could just use something like this. Take a plastic container, cut a hole in it, put tape or melt around the edges so that it doesn't cut the snake snake and you just put that in there put sphagnum moss paper towel under it boom you're all set for heating just like with bedding there's quite a few different options for you to consider and some kind of work better for this snake than others first off is just going to be a regular heat lamp you just put a heat bulb you don't need any special uv light or anything like this you don't need to get like a mercury vapor bulb like a 100 watt power sun or anything like that just get a regular probably 75 watt incandescent bulb and that'll be enough heat for your snake these are also really good at drying out the air so it's also very good at keeping humidity low and these do work best with glass tanks because they are naturally have that mesh lid just for them to sit on but if you have a plastic enclosure or a pvc or a wood enclosure that you either cut a hole in or they have a hole cut in with mesh over over top of it you can use this with them no problem and then you've got under tank heaters which is basically just an adhesive mat that'll have a glue side and basically just sticks to the underside of your enclosure again this kind of works best with glass tanks and with this there's going to come four little nodes that you're going to put at each corner of your tank or your enclosure and that is to lift it up just a little bit because you need airflow if this is trapped with nowhere for the heat to go that is not going to end very well so make sure if you get an under tank heater use those little nodes or put it on like a metal shelf that's got like a graded shelf or something like that so that there is some type of airflow with it. And also with these under tank heaters, you are going to need some type of thermostat to regulate the temperature because these, some of these under tank heaters can burn really hot. So with this, you plug the under tank heater into the thermostat. The thermostat has a little probe that'll go inside the tank and you're gonna set it on the bottom surface of your enclosure, dead center of the heat source. And this way, if the thermostat reads it gets too hot, it'll kick off, or if it needs to get warmer, it'll kick back on. If you are gonna be using an under tank heater with a PVC or plastic enclosure, it really won't work on wood. But if you're gonna use it with one of them, just make sure it is kind of a fire hazard. So if you're gonna use it, just make sure it doesn't burn too, too hot. The thermostat will help a lot with that. If you're using it for a few days and you notice the 90 to 92 degree temperatures are kind of warping the plastic a little bit, Bit, I might switch to one of the other heating sources. Then you've got radiant heat panels, which is basically the opposite of an under tank heater. Instead of adhering to the bottom of the tank, you screw it into the top inside the enclosure. And with these, they got two drill holes usually in it. So you're going to drill that in. And they also usually most of them come with like a special casing so that the snake does touch it. It's not going to burn itself. I use the uh, reptile basic one and those are very, very good. They work very well for me. And again, with these, you are going to need a thermostat because these will burn very, very hot if left to their own devices.
devices. And these really work best with wooden or PVC enclosures. You can't really mount them into a glass tank and usually a plastic tub doesn't really have the height required to kind of put this in. And again, it's kind of a fire hazard with the top on it. So just make sure if you are using one of these, get a thermostat and use it with the right surface. The last option is just gonna be a ceramic heat emitter. Now, most of these suckers burn really, really hot. So if you're going to get this, A, make sure that the snake does not get in any contact with it. And B, make sure you get like the lowest wattage you can. Ceramic heat emitter is basically just a bulb that only emits heat. It does not emit light at all. It only does heat. And like I said, they can get really, really hot. So if you're going to use this, it wouldn't be my kind of go-to option, but if you're gonna use this, it probably works best with, again, just like a bulb, you're gonna either use a mesh lid on a tank or if you have a pre-cut mesh hole on your PVC or wood enclosure, that'll work best. So just really monitor the temps when you start setting this up. Snakes do not need any type of special UV lighting like you need with diurnal basking lizards like beardies, uromastics, iguanas, etc. You don't need it. There are some people out there that argue that certain snake species, especially like diamond pythons and hognose snakes are one of them, do benefit from these UV rays. If you do want to do it, just get something lower strength. You probably don't need like a mercury vapor bulb or a 10.0 UVB light or anything like that. And it is not necessary. I will say that if you want to get it, great. But if you don't, you're not like a terrible keeper for not getting it. It is not absolutely essential to your hognose snake's continued existence to get a UV light. Now, as we just said in heating, snakes do need some type of day-night cycle. They need 10 to 12 hours of light and then the rest being dark. So if you're using like a basking light as your heat source, then that works great because when it kicks off at night, then you're done. But if you don't have that, if you're using like a ceramic heat emitter or if you're using an under tank heater or something like that, you need to find another way to give them this light cycle. Now, if you're keeping them in a room with windows, that can work just as fine. If the light from the window is enough to illuminate the room and illuminates the enclosure, he will be able to tell that it's daytime. Now, if you're doing this, make sure the tank is not like directly in front of the window because then the light from the window will heat up in the tank and that'll turn your tank into an oven and it'll not end well for the hognose snake. So kind of keep it off to the side of the window, but the light from a window can illuminate and work just as well. They don't really need an elaborate setup. This is, I think this is in fact actually one of the cheapest reptile setups that I have of any of the reptiles that I own. They spend a lot of their time digging in the substrate. Having deep substrate is one of the best ways to make a hot bee hognose snake. To make them even more secure, you do want to give them a couple hides, specifically one on the warm side and one on the cool side. So this way, if they do feel like getting up out of the substrate but they still want to remain hidden, they can do so and still regulate their body temperature. And these don't need to be expensive like reptile cave hides. If you want to make like a really naturalistic enclosure, then sure, go for like the $30 reptile cave hide. But if you want to save some money, the snake's not going to care. Use some cardboard boxes. Use some kind of opaque plastic containers. Use things like that. Even take some fake plants, put them on the ground for him to hide under those. Cork bark, whatever, any of that will work. Another thing I also do, and this might get me in a little bit of heat, but I use Use rocks from outside where these guys are from there's a lot of rock so giving them rocks giving them things to slither on especially when they're shedding those rough edges to rub their skin off of that'll really help and I mean if you get rocks from outside if you're really worried about it you can sanitize and sterilize them throw them in the freezer for X amount of days put them in boiling water for X amount of hours I, I forget all the ways to sterilize you if you go online they'll kind of give you instructions for it but if you look at a lot of the bioactive folks they just take their rocks and wood and everything from outside put them in the enclosure because they want those little isopods and other things that come hitchhiking on those to help break waste down. Now with rocks, I usually do hose them off first before throwing them right in, but I don't really do any kind of strict sanitization or anything method for them. I usually take them in, hose them off, and I put them in. I've been doing this for almost God, nine years now, and I've never really run into any issues with it. So if you're worried about it, like I said, you can use the sterilization methods or you can just buy like straight reptile branded rocks off Amazon or from a pet store or something like that. But it just kind of seems like a waste of money to me. A small water bowl for a hognose snake is fine. They don't need anything big because remember big water bowl means more humidity and not a happy hognose snake. You don't really need a huge water bowl. Now I have safe well water so I can just take water right from the tap. But if you're worried about your water quality, if you don't know what's in your well, if you have city water, you can either get like bottled water or if you want a little home remedy, you can just get a cup of water. Just take a cup of your water, leave it out for 24 hours. That'll naturally dechlorinate. The chlorine will naturally evaporate up out of the out of the water, and then you have safe dechlorinated water to use for your snake. For your young juvenile hognose snakes, I would say feeding one pinky twice a week would be good. And then as they get bigger and they start growing more, getting some girth to them, then I would say switching to one appropriately sized rodent every 
week, week and a half will be a good feeding schedule for you. With hognose snakes, you're always gonna be dealing with some type of mouse. Now for adult males, you're gonna be dealing with probably small mice, and then when you have an adult female, you're probably gonna be dealing with adult large mice. And you don't really need to worry about rats. I don't think any hognose snake really gets big enough for you to kind of get on the rat spectrum. When you first bring that little baby hognose snake home, I would not try feeding it right away, because when you first bring that little snake home, he's gonna be freaked out. He's gonna be scared, he's gonna be stressed, he's not gonna be worried about eating. So give it a week or two, let him settle in more. Now what I would do is pick a day, pick like Wednesday or Thursday, and say Wednesday is snake feeding day. Feed him on Wednesday. If he does not eat, leave it out overnight, come back Thursday. If he does not eat on Thursday, then take the pinky out and don't try to feed him again immediately. Wait again until next Wednesday, try again. If you leave it out again and comes Thursday, he has not eaten, just take it out and try again next Wednesday. Because if you just keep trying to rapid fire feed him every single day to make sure he eats, you're just gonna be wasting food. Now, if you go like three months and your baby hognose snake is still not eaten, then yes, that is something to be alarmed about take him to the vet. But if you have a hognose snake that doesn't want to eat for a few weeks, that's pretty natural. Uh, hognose snakes are known sometimes for when they're little being kind of finicky eaters. Because remember, this is an amphibian eater. They are not 100% biologically geared towards eating rodents. So that's why I say if you leave it a few weeks, let him get more settled, let him kind of start building that hunger a little bit, you have a better chance of him going for the food. I'm not going to talk about feeding live rodents in this video. Uh, I mean, if there are people out there that do that, good for them. I don't do that with any of my snakes. All of my snakes and any hognose snake I've ever worked with, honestly, I've all gotten to get on frozen thawed. I'll even get pythons in. People swear up and down will only eat live and I'll prove them wrong. So really, I just don't see the risk in it. But if other people out there do that, that's fine. Now, with, when you're feeding a frozen thawed rodent, you don't obviously want to just give it to it frozen. What you do is you want to put it in a little bowl of warmish water and let it thaw. Let it thaw until you can kind of pick it up and it's kind of warm to the touch and it's all squishy and it's not rock hard. It might take an hour or so. And when that's all good to go, then you're going to be ready to feed the snake. Also, do not thaw any of your feeders in the microwave because that is a very dangerous thing to do. Microwaves heat very unevenly. So if you take a mouse out of the microwave, sure, the outside might be warm to the touch, but the insides could be absolutely nuked, lava scalding hot. And if you give that to your snake, that is not going to be good for the snake. That will most likely kill the snake. So do not use the microwave. Just put it in a bowl of warm water. That'll work just fine. Also, wherever you get your hognose snake from, whether it's online or from a breeder, ask them, what are they eating? When did they last eat? How often are they eating? Have all of their previous feedings been successful? This way, if you can kind of check to make sure the breeder knows what he's actually talking about, but you can make sure that your snake is eating. Because like I said, hognose snakes, especially when they're young, can kind of be finicky eaters. And it's really not uncommon for even adult snakes to go on hunger strikes. Bernie here stops eating for a good three to four months over the winter. So it's just good to know that your snake is started on rodents and it's ready to go because it gives you one less thing to kind of worry about. If you do get a hognose snake in that you know is having a kind of difficult time viewing the rodents as food, what you can do, there's a few different things to try. First off, you might have to try live prey for a little bit, getting live pinkies, maybe the movements and smells and things might trigger the snake to try and eat it. In my experience, hognose snakes don't have anywhere near the type of feeding response you see with a lot of other colubrids. <laughs> when I go to feed him, I basically put the food in front of him. He kind of huffs up at first because he thinks, oh, don't mess with me, I'm a big guy. But then he notices his food and then he just kind of takes a weird lazy chomp out of it. He doesn't really do any kind of intense feeding response. He's just, I don't, hognose snakes are derpy. <laughs> But to avoid any possible bites, just use a pair of tongs. Uh, if you just get some tweezer tongs, hold the pinky at a nice distance. Again, there's, at least in my experience, I haven't really noticed any real big striking from these snakes, but even so, they're a small snake. They don't have a really big strike range. It's not like you're trying to feed like a six or seven foot king snake. So just put it right in front of them. Don't make him work for it. Don't bring him outside of the enclosure where he might potentially like fall or anything like that. If you have a front opener like I do, just put it right in front of him. He'll chomp on it and you're good to go. If he doesn't chomp on it, leave it there, come back and check. Some people believe that you can feed your snake in a separate container outside of their enclosure to reduce cage aggression. This is a stupid myth. They learn the difference between when I'm going in to feed them versus when I'm taking them out. If I go in and I just dangle my hand in front of their face, then yeah, that's a really stupid thing to do. I'm gonna get bit that way because that's how they're used to getting fed is a warm thing dangling in front of their face. But if I reach right in and start immediately taking them out, I grab them and start immediately pulling them out without hesitation. They immediately cool down. They immediately know, oh, okay, it's not food and their feeding response goes away. So it can be done. 
feeding in a separate container is just an unnecessary risk that potentially really stress out your snake and make them regurgitate the food that they just ate. And regurgitation is not something you want to deal with with snakes. It is not a good process for them at all. It can really mess them up. So you do not want to do it. Just feed the snake in the enclosure. It'll be fine. It'll be absolutely fine. And also after you feed, I would not handle for 24 to 48 hours. Let it give it a chance to digest because again, you, while it's digesting, it doesn't really want to be picked up and handled a bunch. Anytime I feed snakes, they don't go to programs for at least two days. So just give them some time to digest. These are such a handleable, easy to work with snake. They are just super chill for the most part. I have run into a few people that say their hog noses are a little bit nippy when you're handling them, especially if they're not used to being handled. They feel the soft skin they might assume it's food or something like that. I have never personally worked with any of these kind of hognose snakes and they are venomous, like I said, but again, envenomations are very rare. Their teeth are very small. The venom is very weak. But if you are worried about it for the first few times you go to handle your hognose snake, if you just get a pair of gloves, that'll immediately A, kind of hide your skin and B, also hide your heat signature. And usually that's enough to deter most kind of nippy snakes from doing it. As far as their temperament, the best two words I could use to describe hognose snakes, at least the ones I've worked with, including including both of the ones that I have owned are drama queen because sometimes when you go to reach into their enclosure, they can have such a dramatic little tantrum. On some occasions, they'll be a bit huffy when you go to get a mouth. They'll kind of huff up and hiss a little bit, a bit blow up, strike at you with their mouth closed, have these just adorable hissy little tantrums. Uh, Bernie does this all the time when I go in to get him out. Almost every single time he huffs up when I first open the enclosure and I just call him an adorable little grump and I take him out anyways. So don't let it freak you out if your hog nose does this little huffy fit when you go in to take him out. But if you are worried about this, just get a little snake hook and just hook the snake out that way. So that way, if you are worried about, even if they're bluff striking with their mouth closed, if it does kind of freak you out a little bit, just get the snake hook, just hook them out. And 99% of the time, as soon as you get them in your hands, they're absolutely fine. And because this is such a small snake, they are a very fragile snake. They don't have a lot of muscles to them like a lot of pythons do. They are mostly just gonna be sitting in your hand. You can see Bernie's kind of wrapping his tail around me as an anchor point, but they don't have the muscles that like Jade, my green tree python does. She's arboreal. She's used to being up in delicate branches and things like that. Bernie is not. So when you do hold a small snake, you do need to be very careful. Keep your hands open. Don't like desk squeeze them or clench them or anything like that. And the first few times you go to handle them, I would say probably handle them either in their enclosure or like over your lap or something like that or even older over a table like I'm doing with Bernie now. So if they do kind of flip out and squirm and wiggle out of your hands. They're not taking a giant fall to the ground. They just kind of hit the table right here and they'll be fine. And once they get more used to you, they kind of get more used to being handled and everything. They'll kind of get more used to the ins and out of your fingers and being comfortable in your hands and on your arms. Then you can kind of really start kind of handling them, maybe taking them outside and things like that. When you first get your hog nose snake, just like I said with feeding, when you're going to feed it, give it a few weeks to feed. And then when you're going to handle it, I would give it a few weeks after that. Make sure it's got a few meals in it before you start trying to handle it. Make sure it's feeding regularly and everything. Because when you first take a hognose snake out to handle it, if it's not used to it, that's going to stress the hognose snake out. So you just want to make sure you avoid any unnecessary stress. Make sure he's eating well before you start worrying about handling. And I know this is the last thing I'm saying in this care video. And if you get a hognose snake, you're going to be super excited. You want to handle all the time and everything, but it's for the betterment of the long-term care of the snake that you make sure it's eating well and everything before you start trying to get it used to you. So that was our care video on the Western Hognose Snake. They're easily one of the best beginner pet snakes out there in my opinion, even with the few caveats I mentioned in the video. Like the video if you learned something or if you found it useful, hopefully you found it helpful. Comment down below if you have a hognose snake or if you wanna get one. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you later.